If I conferred with our furry friends, man to animal, think of the amazing repartee. If I could walk with the animals, talk with the animals, grunt and squeak and squawk with the animals, and they could talk to me. Hello and welcome to Pet Watch, a monthly program about the Williamson County Animal Center. I'm Debbie Sims and I'll be your host today. And my guest is our shelter director, Laura Chavaria. Hi, Laura. Hi, good morning. Good morning to you. It's glad to, I'm glad to have you back, and I know our viewers are because you recently went on a rescue mission. Uh, we all know that there have been so many uh, hurricanes and natural disasters here in the United States just in the past three months. Mm -hmm. We had Hurricane Harvey uh, hit Houston, and then we had Hurricane Irma turn and go toward Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and disaster rescue for animals is an aspect that people may not think about. We all think about the people and we want to get the people out and the local authorities are rescuing and boats and everything else they can think of and we watch it on the news. Um, but what is the general um, involvement of people like you when the disaster occurs as far as the animals go? So our job is to um, find animals that are left behind. A lot of people when they're leaving in an emergency maybe don't have a plan for their animals. So they'll leave them behind. So we need to go check those residences to see if the animals are being cared for or we retrieve them. So that's one aspect of it. Another one is if they are in floodwaters, um, we actually have to go into swift water and rescue them. It could be a dog, a cat, we've done cattle. Um, so animals that have been left behind, animals that are currently in the disaster are two main um, portions and then we have the sheltering. So once we save the animal, um, our goal is to reunite it with its owner, but we have to provide it shelter in that meantime. And, and despite all the warnings, there was still a, a, a very swift rise in the water in many of these areas. And today we're going to talk about uh, mid-southern Florida area, mm -hmm. uh, central Florida and mid-southern Florida, where you ended up going and helping after Hurricane Irma. Um, you say people leave their pets behind. We can't be judgmental about that. Right. Maybe they were at work that day. Could the be. water rose at home and they couldn't get back in the neighborhood. Right. So um, there are extreme cases where people actually tied their animals up, which is a really bad idea uh, anytime, especially when the floodwaters are rising. Right. Uh, but you are uh, concerned about getting your property secured and getting mm -hmm. back and getting your pets. And sometimes you can't. Right. So For your own safety, sometimes right. you can't. Right. And the authorities are busy uh, lifting people off rooftops with helicopters. Mm -hmm. So the little dog that got left behind in a certain house, it may be a couple of days before somebody gets to that. Right. And you mentioned farms. We don't mm -hmm. think about uh, if you had to pack up your, your little uh, schnauzer and get in a canoe and get out, that would be easy. Mm -hmm. But if you have a herd of cattle and, a, a, you know, an Horses or horses, or which is very common in middle or um, central Florida, which we were dispatched to. Mm -hmm. So we saw a lot of folks that were near the river that was flooding, and they couldn't get all of their herd to safety. So we actually had to go into floodwaters in a boat um, and make those cattle swim approximately a mile. Wow. Now, mind you, they have been segregated from the herd for approximately a couple days. Mm -hmm. We don't know if they've been eating. Um, they're standing in neck level water, so they're tired. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a majority of our calls was spent on cattle um, because that's a huge um, livelihood in sure. central, ten or central Florida. So um, a lot of people don't think about that. And obviously um, the larger the animal, the harder it is to rescue them. So, mm -hmm. but it was a lot of fun. A lot of people were very, very thankful for our help because I don't think they realize that there are agencies out there that are completely devoted to rescuing animals. And you went there with a group called Code 3 Associates. Associates. Tell I us, did. How did, what is Code 3? Where is it located? Code 3 Associates is uh, based out of Colorado and they specialize in disaster response, especially with animals. So they have done fires, earthquakes, flooding. They go all over the United States. and. Um, I got trained by them earlier this year. You have to take some FEMA courses and then I took some swift water rescue courses from them um, to learn how to use the equipment, um, how to follow the chain of command because obviously in a disaster, sometimes communication um, falls apart. So you need to understand um, what the best practice is and what the process is. So I went through training with them um, and then I got on their on-call list, which means um, I'm certified to go out and help them 
I've worked with them in the past through training. Um, and then after Hurricane Harvey hit, I knew a lot of the first responders were probably very exhausted because then Hurricane Irma was scheduled to come mm -hmm. a week later. Um, so I reached out to Code 3 and said, I would love to help. Please let me know if you need me. And they were able to dispatch me out to um, middle Florida for about eight days. Now, did they have some people that are full-time with their... They're a not-for-profit? They're a non-for-profit. And they um, have some staff. They do. They, I think they have roughly five staff. Um, and then the majority of the responders are actually volunteers that have other full-time jobs that are usually in the animal field. But some of them are accountants and bankers, um, that this is their passion and this mm -hmm. is their hobby. Um, and it's their way of giving back in a time of need. And many shelter professionals like you mm -hmm. are, take that extra step and then you're on call yes. in case something happens. Um, I was interested in a, the tractor trailer truck that Code 3 owns. BART. BART? BART. It's, okay, and it's a, does it, what is that? Does it stand for anything, BART? Or it does. I wish I knew the what it was. I wish I knew what it was. But Big BART. Big old truck. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. BART is a rig that has all of our equipment on it. So we have rafts on there, boats, um, large animal rescue tools. And then we also lived on there um, because obviously when you go into a disaster, there may not be hotels, there may not be gas, so we have to be self-sufficient. Um, so there are six bunks in there, a very small shower and a bathroom, mm -hmm. and we lived with six other people for eight days. Um, so you get to learn a lot about each other. Mm -hmm. You work about 12 hours in the field, and then you're just so exhausted that you eat dinner, you take a shower, and you go to bed. But it was great bonding with other people that have similar passions as me. Is, it, is there medical equipment? For there's, animal first aid, or how far animal, do they take it? There's animal first aid. Um, the ASPCA also has a rig, but theirs is more devoted toward medical triage, where ours is more toward, or Code 3 is more toward actually dispatching and mm -hmm. rescuing, and then we use someone else's rig for the triaging. Okay, and you coordinated all those efforts. I know that you, when Hurricane Irma was scheduled to hit and you were called up, um, you basically got to the northern part of Florida before it hit. Yes. And we, then waited. Correct. We yeah. staged, um, you know, it's hard to tell the path of the storm, but we staged in an area that we thought was going to be safe. Um, we got down there before travel became an issue. We drove from Tennessee to um, close to Jacksonville. We parked, stayed there for a day. The hurricane hit um, eastern Florida, and then we followed it up the path um, to northern Florida, and we just waited to see where we were needed because the ASPCA was down there. Um, um, American Humane, HSUS, us. So we have to collaborate with those other agencies to make sure that we're using our resources and responding to everybody that, that needs us. When you went for training with Code 3, what were the, some of the things you, you learned? Where did they conduct the training? The training was in Knoxville. It was a week long. Um, we did field assessment where we would go out. They would let loose three horses, and us as a team would have to um, slowly get them back into where they need to be, which was very interesting because we had no tools. So we had to come up with what are we going to use? Um, and we couldn't scare them. The more you would scare them, they would run away from you. So that was one huge exercise that we did. We also learned um, how to build a, um, it's kind of like a triangle and how to elevate an animal when they're injured and save them via a helicopter. So we learned that. Um, swift water rescue, we got into dry suits and we were put into swift water and how to regulate your body temperature. A lot of it is your own self-care because if you can't care for yourself, you're not going to be any good to help that animal. So um, how to keep yourself safe and then water, different weather, mm -hmm. no equipment, basically putting us in situations that um, we'll find in real life um, wow. in a week-long situation. Yeah, it was it was exciting. And there was no chance you were going to get too cold in Florida. The, the danger was too hot. Correct. Because it was, it was September, but it was extreme temperatures. It was. Right? Yes. And um, another thing is the water. A lot of people don't understand that floodwaters have um, bacteria in there. Um, a lot of things have leaked into the flood area. So we've seen a lot of kids that were swimming and we had to tell them, look, you need to get out of the water. Um, so a lot of things are 
decontaminating once we get out, making sure we take our suits off, spray them down, wash them with um, Dawn, and Dawn soap and water. Um, all the boats are decontaminated when we get out. So there were some folks that came from Hurricane Harvey that did get water in their mouth or in their eyes and ended up getting sick. So again, a lot mm. of it is self-care, how to protect yourself. That way you can continue to respond to those emergencies. Wow. Well, I guess you don't want the responders to be sick. Right. Yeah, <laughs> because they can't save anybody. Right. <laughs> so when you were, uh, how many days were you on this tractor trailer living on it? Um, it was eight short days. <laughs> um, it was it was just tiny, tiny, tiny living quarters. But again, you weren't ever in those bunks because you were right. out responding. Right. Um, and I could have slept standing up because you're just so tired. Um, it was very small. I mean, it was smaller than my dorm room. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that the bunks are about the size of um, a coffin for any, Sounds like a submarine it, type it, bunk. Kind of like a submarine. I mean, yeah. Um, the fun times were when we'd go out and do a food run and find whatever closest Walmart was open. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they didn't have freeze, freezer items or mm -hmm. refrigerated items. Mm -hmm. So we were just living off of fruit and granola bars and whatever we could to just sustain us throughout mm -hmm. the day. Where did the truck park? Where did you live? Um, so we parked in multiple areas. So we first got um, responded to Osceola County. Mm -hmm. um, St. Cloud area and we parked in the animal shelter a lot because our job was to field any calls that were coming from them. They would communicate, hey, mm -hmm. um, somebody had mentioned that they had left behind their dogs at this address. Can you investigate it? So they would communicate that to us and then we would dispatch out from their parking lot. Um, once they didn't need us any longer after a couple days, then we were dispatched to another location um, and we parked in a huge parking lot again, usually a large gas station, um, a flying J, a pilot station, um, because the rig is so big that we need to be able to turn around and mm -hmm. get out there quickly. Were there other other agencies from all across the country there and other emergency groups? Yes, HSUS had their rig, um, American Humane had their rig, so it was really interesting. Every morning you'd wake up and you'd see all these semi-trucks just lined up. Mm -hmm. um, some of them went, some of the staff went on runs together, um, some of them ate breakfast together. You met the fire department from Phoenix, Arizona. There were so many people. Electrical, from, electric companies electric often companies. from all over the country it there was to restore electricity. One and, huge staging area of people from all over the United States that mm -hmm. were giving up of their time to help these people. And it, mm -hmm. you know, you saw a lot of bad being down there, but I saw more good and people were, you know, building each other up and working together. I never heard anybody complain. Mm -hmm. I never heard anybody talk about how they're tired or how they wanted to go home. Um, we were just all there to support each other, and no. it makes me want to yeah. go out even more. Animal people never complain. No. I mean, they'll, they, anim they have a heart for the rescue, mm -hmm. and they'll do what it takes to rescue. And I know you had, a, you had an, an interesting experience with the cow that you had I did. that was stuck on a little bit of high ground or was it yes. treading water or what so, so you had a couple of them I know you got out yeah, of the farm area I had two so the call came in that a herd was separated it was a farm that was right next to a river that had flooded um, he had about 300 cattle and 100 were segregated so we got into a boat we boated out there there were two boats actually we had dry suits on and helmets and all protective equipment and the first two cattle that we found were on um, a rise ground, mm -hmm. but it was flooding. They had nothing to eat. They'd been there for days. You could tell that they were tired. There were bugs flying around them. And there was actually an alligator on the same spot of land. It was a baby alligator. Um, so our job was not to scare them, but to push them toward the pasture, which was about a mile away. So one of them followed but us. But it was water. It was that water. Mile, it was a mile of water. Correct. And you didn't know how deep it was. Right. Because the water is pretty much dark brown. Yes. And, and there's fence lines. So you don't know if when you're running the motor on the boat, if it'll get caught yep, up on a fence bar, line. Bar fence. Yeah. yeah. So again, safety is key. Um, and you could tell that these cows were really, really tired and they were going to have to swim a mile. It was either they're going to have to swim or they're going to have to stay there and most likely drown. Um, so the two boats, we would basically herd them um, if we found high grand, ground, we would let them rest, and then we would herd them again. It took us probably two hours to get both of them. I can say that successfully we got every one of them except for two. So out of that 100, we got 98. Um, we were in our dry suits from about 8 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but it was successful. And the farmer you know, gave us a hug. 
he said, I didn't know that people out there existed like you guys. He tried to give us a donation, and we said no, like a cash donation. Mm -hmm. And we said, no, you know, we're a nonprofit. If you mm -hmm. want to learn more about us, please go on our website. You can make a donation there. Um, but it was nice to see that he was just very appreciative because mm -hmm. those cows are not only, you know, his livelihood, but they're also his animals that he cares for. Um, and, and the further you are from the city, the less resource agencies, people yes. concentrate on the higher population area in the city and the personal pets mm -hmm. people have, and they don't think about the farmer whose cows are drowning. Right. Um, so that, that was an interesting, and I think, I, I think you had to entice them with the cows with a bale of hay or a yes. pa yeah. One of them liked the hay, the other one not so That much. is an interesting story. <laughs> yes, it was. Because um, I didn't know cows would swim a mile. It was I, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> they, sure. They're good swimmers when they have to be. Oh, okay, well, yeah. survival mode. Yeah. Um, and and tr uh, trust of the human. Yes. I mean, that's a lot of it. One of my teammates was playing Eric Clapton because one of the cows really responded really like well <laughs> to Eric Clapton. Well, you try anything. Well, we you would to make a cow anything. swim? Yes. I, would, I would try anything. Um, now, local shelters, get when the flood hits, the shelters flood. Yes. And that's a crisis because you think about our building, when we have 50 dogs, yep. 75 cats, another probably 40 animals, um, that are lost or need to find their owner. Mm -hmm. And if we suddenly have, a, you know, a hundred animals, then the water's rising. It's a, it's a crisis. It because is. a high concentration of, of pets that are there to be adopted. And then all of a sudden there's a crisis in the community. So the shelter's pets are threatened. Mm -hmm. And then all the other people in the community need the shelter mm -hmm. to help them with their pets. So what did you find? Did you get to any shelters down there or see any shelters that had been damaged? I, I did, and that was the biggest learning thing for me that I can bring back to our shelter at Williamson County is to make sure that we are prepared for if a disaster happens. Um, a lot of the shelters down there were prepared. They're in Florida. They understand that hurricanes are a common occurrence. Um, so a lot of them had disaster plans in place. So what happens is when displaced animals that have either been left behind by the flood or were drowning in the flood, when they arrive at the shelter, they need space. So the shelter staff will try to send their current adoptable animals up to northern safe shelters to be um, adopted okay. out. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times you'll hear that rescues up here in Tennessee had taken animals from the flood. Now those aren't animals, the majority of them are not animals that were drowning or right. were left behind. Right. Those were the animals that were in those shelters, were adoptable, and needed to be placed they somewhere for They didn't have families space. and they Correct. were on the adoption floor. Correct. Okay. okay. Now, what happened when all those new animals that were threatened by the flood were placed in the local shelters? A lot of them were just separated from their yes. families for days on end because the water didn't recede down there, did it? Right. So it, it was a couple days until people could get back into the city or, you know, the county where there's not that many people mm -hmm. and there were a lot of flooding. Um, the people have to give them the thumbs up to go back into their house right? Um, and they have to assess their damages. So it is a couple of days before they realize, okay, where's my animal? Where can I go? So a lot of the big things that we had to do was signage, street signage that says, if you're missing your animal, please come to the staging area okay. um, to communicate because a lot of times internet doesn't work. Um, there are some certain apps that you can get during a disaster, but mm -hmm. good old fashioned road signage really helped us reunite. And I would say about 99% of the animals were reunited with their owners. Where did, where did they... Uh, keep those animals in a holding area in like a yes. public facility, like a arena no. or something like that. Or so where did they put them. We had the staging area at the um, 911 center where we were staged, and then we put up a um, temporary shelter, and that was um, manned by American Humane Society. That was mm -hmm. their mission for the entire um, deployment mm -hmm. was to provide care for those animals. So we had a duck that had been left behind in a, a trailer for a week. Mm -hmm. It was dehydrated that they had to help. We had um, two pit bulls that were left behind, no food, no water in their house that they had to care for, cattle that were left behind. Um, so their job is to get them back to being healthy, um, address any medical issues, and then hopefully reunite them. So Code 3 um, focuses on the actual retrieval and rescue, mm -hmm. and then we kind of handed off the mission of sheltering to American Humane. And the sheltering people have a whole other set of of a mission yes. and they have they're prepared for sheltering and caring both food water and medical in an area with just kennels set up on a probably a concrete floor yes right? this was in a um, like a lean-to shelter that they had to set up any type of kennel you can think of um, 
and then they have to be prepared to house that animal for two weeks, a month, because they don't know how long it's going to be until those folks can get back into their property. So mm -hmm. um, sheltering is a whole other animal, mm -hmm. and that's why it's so important for Code 3 and American Humane and HSUS to collaborate, because if we can divide and conquer, that makes us a lot stronger. Right. And in, you are only in one little t county. You spend a lot of your time in this Acadia area. Mm -hmm. Arcadia. Arcadia, Florida. And just magnify that. I mean, you were only in one little isolated yep. area, and that was happening through a large portion of central Florida. Yes. Wasn't it? It was yes. happening in Tampa. Key Downtown West got Tampa hit. was Florida, uh, yep. flooded. I mean, the, the shelter there was probably overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, but you were out in a rural area, and it, this problem is, wasn't isolated for right. you. It was it was the whole area. Right. We would clear one county, and then we'd get picked up from another county because they needed help. So it was interesting to see all the resources kind of get divided out. And then once we weren't needed, we would shift and go to another county. Um, it was really coordinated. Everybody communicated, worked well with each other. It was interesting to see, you know, I know the day-to-day -day operations at the shelter and how... Um, it changes on a dime. Every day is different. Down there, it's just magnified, and to see it work on a larger scale was really inspiring. I think, um, you know, what you brought back will be valuable because when we did have the Nashville flood um, seven years ago, I guess it was, mm -hmm. the water rose around the shelter. Well, I probably would have had to rise another five or six feet to actually inundate the shelter, but there were employees yes. at our shelter that had to wade through this uh, flooded roads and parking lots and because we're right by the Harpeth River. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not uncommon for, right. especially in this area, for little creeks to feed into the big creeks. And sometimes the crisis happens two or three days after the rain. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. They think the flooding happens immediately, but it actually happens a couple of days after we've received the flooding. And um, not only do we have to care about our animals that are in the shelter, but we also have animal control officers that have to respond. And so thinking about how to get them to the shelter um, from their homes, what if their area is flooded and the shelter's not? So there's so many factors you have to think about, um, but I gained a lot of experience and hopefully Williamson County can benefit from it. And uh, hopefully we'll be doing some drills in the future mm -hmm. to kind of practice because if you don't practice, you know, sometimes it, it looks better on paper than um, in real life. Yeah, uh, we, we, uh, we have our share of farm animals yes. and uh, needs that come up in this county because we do still have a lot of rural property and we just the other day we had three goats <laughs> um, we did yeah and we have had a water rescue in the past mm -hmm. of a dog that somebody called that said there's a dog in the middle of Harpeth. On rock in the Harpeth River and it won't come it won't swim either way um, mm -hmm. so fortunately we had th that training um, how do you qualify to go to code three can who can become a volunteer for them? A lot of people want to get involved when there's a disaster that hits, and that's great. A lot of good-hearted animal um, activists. So mm -hmm. how I got inspired and how I got trained was you have to take preliminary FEMA courses online. They're free. They're online. Um, there's about five or six. And once you take those, then you sign up for um, training either through Code 3, NACA. They all have their own disaster training. Now tell us about NACA, in case people don't know what NACA is. NACA is National Animal Care and Control Association of the United States. Okay. Um, and that's something that you took tests to be a member of. Yes. And that's a fairly uh, small number of people in the United States that have the NACA certification. So it's kind of the highest level, a shelter, yes. a shelter director or a shelter employee could go. Correct. Um, now, you said, though, that regular people like accountants or teachers mm -hmm. also have a heart for this. Can can an organization like Code 3 use those people? Absolutely. Uh -huh. If they are willing to learn, um, the training is around $500 for a week-long training, and then there's different trainings. There's basic training, and then you can work your way up. But absolutely, if they want to give of their time and of their money to learn, then they're willing to use you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you they certainly are safety-oriented, and I know mm -hmm. we've, we've the pictures of you are, I can't even find you under all that. <laughs> the, uh, it looks like a hazmat suit. It was hot. <laughs> hazmat suit with a life vest with a helmet and something else around your waist, step yes. tethered to somebody else. And I couldn't even find you. I couldn't even tell which one was you when I looked at the it's pictures. very fashion forward. But that's the way it should be. Yes. Because nobody needs to be swimming in yes. an area that's been flooded. And um, 
it's just it's just a, a matter of learning and having the professionals handle it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure there's a lot of that. Is people are upset because they left their animals or they weren't home when the flood happened and mm -hmm. they've been terrified for days. Right. So there's a lot of e emotion mm -hmm. and there's a lot of shock because they've lost their belongings. Right. They just want to find their dog. So I, I think that would be the place I would want to be is at the, when they're being reunited at mm -hmm. the uh, center where the animals are, is go in there and find your animals safe yes. and being cared for. Uh, that makes all the difference in the world. Um, so if the average person doesn't want to go to, go through training mm -hmm. and jump in, um, the water and try to make a cow swim <laughs> if they'd rather contribute uh, yes. their time in other ways um, we have a volunteer program at the shelter and there are many organizations you can give to mm -hmm. uh, that and help them in the event of a disaster so what yes. what would you encourage the average person to do to look into those things I would look into first getting involved with your local shelter because they can always reach out to the disaster affected areas and help them um, the main people that came out in the, the event of a disaster was um, ASPCA, HSUS, American Humane, and Code 3. So if your heart goes to them, I would say to donate some of your funds to them to help them with disasters. Yeah, everybody wants to help. We were getting a lot of calls that yes. day, but it takes a village, <clears throat> but it, it takes several days to get the professionals on the ground to mm -hmm. assess. And, and how many animals would you, if, is there an estimate from Irma alone in Florida, no. animals that were... It takes approximately six months to a year to get the disaster statistics. report. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we're still waiting on Harvey and Irma, so it'll be interesting to get those stats back. Oh, yeah. And two right in a row has mm -hmm. probably taxed the resources of yes. many of these agencies because they're still in, in Houston and then a disaster hits in Florida. Mm -hmm. So they've had to divide and conquer as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, that's been so interesting to find out what it's like to be on the ground in a in a disaster. We can't all do that, but uh, we admire you for doing it Thank and uh, taking the time and having the passion for that. I want to remind our viewers that we will be closed at the shelter for Veterans Day on Friday, November 10th, and then on Saturday, November 18th, we will be having another Clear the Shelter event along with uh, Subaru and Daryl Waltrip Subaru of Franklin. It's called Share the Love. It kicks off their annual Share the Love a campaign in which you can purchase a Subaru from Daryl Waltrip and uh, check off a box on your contract and we will get a contribution for the purchase of that Subaru. Uh, we'll also be doing the Share the Love uh, Shelter event on the 18th with all fees waived and paid by Daryl Waltrip Subaru at the shelter. So uh, mark that down for November 18th. And then we'll be close on Thanksgiving Day of course, November 23rd, and then on the Friday after that, we'll have our big um, Black Friday opening, and we will have open for regular hours with specials on our animals. It may be a big shopping day for the rest of the world, but it's a huge adoption day for shelters. So uh, if you're thinking about that or a pet for the holidays uh, for your family, now is the time to start looking. Uh, and if you'd like to help out by giving one of our shelter pets a home for a few nights during the holidays, we'll be having a home for the holidays program that you could participate in where you foster uh, and take an animal home. Just get them out of the shelter and give them a break uh, around Christmas time. Uh, so if you'd like to participate in that, please uh, follow us on Facebook or uh, our website, which is www.adoptwcac.org. Laura, I wanna thank you for sharing you. your uh, rescue experience in uh, Florida and hopefully you've inspired some of our viewers and they'll be wanting to donate their time or find out more about those organizations. I hope you enjoyed this uh, session here on Pet Watch and I hope you'll join us next month. If I conferred with our furry friends, man to animal, think of the amazing repartee. If I could walk with the animals, talk with the animals, grunt and squeak and squawk with the animals, and they Out of the Wild by David Harris. Sound ricochets through the valley, across the river, bank to bank. From the porch you hear the wails that sound at first like sirens. The dog rises, nervous, and sniffs, and stays close. He knows his cousin's call. 
Just beyond Manhattan's nighttime glow, coyotes haunt these hills. In the morning, you grab the train for Grand Central while wildness sleeps in your backyard. Thank you.